everybody welcome back to my channel i hope you're all well i hope you're all doing great and if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is kiva and i do a thing called true crime tuesdays where i talk about true crime on a tuesday and today i'm talking about the west memphis free which i hadn't heard of this case it's very big in america but not over here and it happened before i was born but this case is very heartbreaking it refers to the murder of three little boys and three teenagers who wrongfully went down for their murder and the West Memphis Free is actually the teenagers not the boys as I first thought because I'm dumb. This case obviously is heartbreaking it involves the murder of children so please if you are like sensitive then don't watch this video maybe I don't want to upset anyone but yeah let's just get into it. Alright so this case is a little bit crazy so bear with me because there's a lot of information and I physically could not include it all in this video. It would have been 50 bazillion years long. Um, so if you want to do any further research, then you can go ahead and search the internet. Just be careful because there are pictures and videos out there of them retrieving the bodies. And I don't want you to not realize that. So just be careful when researching this case because those are easily accessed on the internet. So this case takes place in West Memphis in a small town called Arkansas. Now this town, they were very Christian. It was a very small town, very religious. It was a very tight, close knit community where everyone knew everyone. It was one of those places. So the story is based around three boys called James Moore, Christopher Boyers and Stevie Branch and these boys were all eight years old, they were all really good friends, went to the same school and they were in the same boy scout group and on the 5th of May 1993 these three boys were just out playing and in this time it was a lot more like seen as socially okay to like your kids out and play. It was a lot safer, this was considered to be a really safe town and a safe place so parents would let their kids out from a young age to just play and they'd always come back fine. Now these boys were known for just being good boys, they would never do anything bad so the parents were a bit worried when they didn't return home and it became the evening, it was becoming a bit darker and the parents were quite worried. So John Boyers, who is Christopher Boyers' adoptive father, he made the first police report at 7pm but the last time that the boys were seen was actually 6.30 p.m. by Terry, who is Stevie Branch's stepfather. Now, obviously the families were all very worried, so they were out searching for most of the night, but the police didn't get a full search out till the next day. And this search, so many people joined in because, like I said, this was a small town, everyone knew everyone, and they were all very worried about these three little boys. Now, on May 6th, so this is the day after the boys were last seen, an officer called Steve Jones, he was doing a search of the nearby woods when he found a black trainer which looked like it belonged to one of the boys, and this was found at 1.45pm. Now, this was found right by a little creek, which is like a little shallow area of water, so he puts his foot down in the creek, but his foot gets caught on something. And it actually turns out his foot got caught on the bodies of one of the boys. They were all found in this area and they were all stripped naked and they were all hogtied as well with their own shoelaces. And obviously the community was so shocked and heartbroken by this. Like these three innocent boys who would do something like this, you know, it's a horrible, heinous crime. And like I said, they were found naked and their clothes were all like scattered around the area and most of them were actually inside out. Now they all had some minor injuries, some like cuts and stuff, but Chris had the worst injuries. I'm not gonna go into detail about what happened, but he basically had a lot of mutilation of his genitals. Um, and it's unsure why Chris was targeted for this but Chris actually died from his injuries it's suspected he died from like the shock of it while the other two boys died from drowning and the tests that were done around the area proved that they were actually killed in this area because there was no like drag marks or the luminal tests didn't show any like signs of any foul play like with the movement of the bodies now from the get-go police suspected that more than one person was involved firstly because all of the knots in the shoelaces were tied different and because it would have been very hard for one person to have done this by themselves without one of the boys screaming or running away like to overpower three boys i know they were young but still it would have taken a lot to like for one person to have committed this crime now in small towns like this rumors spread fast and the rumors started to spread about the genital mutilation of chris Boyers, and 
People started to suspect that it was a satanic ritual and that these boys had been sacrificed to the devil, to Satan. Um, and this was because there was apparently satanic rituals already going on in this specific area of the woods, though this is unconfirmed. And I mean, there was nothing else to suggest this. It was just a genital mutilation. Like there was no symbols or signs anywhere. The town's Christian beliefs were biased towards it being a satanic ritual. I think that the town leaned towards this because they didn't want to believe that God would allow this to happen. And from the get go, people had their suspicions about certain characters and a lot of people brought this one name forward to the police and the police were hearing this name over and over again. So obviously they decided to investigate and they latched onto this person. So this person was 18 year old Damien Eccles. And Damien Eccles, he fit this character of being like a satanic ritual person i don't really know but basically he wore all black he was a bit different he liked you know kind of more gothic and rock music um and people believed that he was a satanist and that he was definitely capable of this crime damien's parents actually said they're worried about him taking part in witchcraft and satanic rituals and in his teen years i actually sent him off to a mental institution because they obviously they live in a christian town they don't really want their son to be taking part in these rituals and when he was there, he received a full disability allowance, which meant that he didn't have to work and he would have got money from the government because his mental illness was so bad. So Damien actually described himself as being suicidal, homicidal, sociopathic, schizophrenic and manic depressive. That was from his words. No one made him say that at all. But he did know that he was very mentally ill. And it helped that Damien also had a criminal record. So he'd been a shoplifter in his childhood and he's been arrested quite a few times for like petty shoplifting and him and his girlfriend actually ran away but it was there was a massive storm going on so they took shelter in a trailer so he got arrested for like breaking and entering into this property that didn't belong to him he was also well known in school for having a very violent tendency and he was always in detention and once when he was in detention someone in detention they accidentally cut their wrist and Damien is said that he started sucking this boy's wrist to get the blood out of it. And this is something that's confirmed, but Damien has said a few months before the murder that he drank blood from a human and this gave him superpowers. And that's confirmed that he said that, so... Now, his girlfriend, who called Domini... Domini Tears, I think that's how you say her name, um, she was actually pregnant at the time of like the murders and his arrest and everything. Her aunt actually claimed that she saw Damien near the crime scene about 9pm but this is not confirmed by anyone. Like Damien actually lived with his nan because he had a lot of like issues, his family had issues and a lot of run-ins with social workers. But Damien's nan could not confirm where he was on the night but Damien said he wasn't anywhere near the crime scene. Now Damien had a friend called Jason Baldwin and Jason was 16 at this time. They were very good friends, they had really similar interests, they went to the same school and they knew each other very very well. So that meant that Damien was also thought to be involved in this crime even though there was no evidence that either of them were. And Jason also still had a police record like Damien did for vandalism which isn't really like a big crime but to the police when they're looking into a murder they look at everything don't they? The and the third person I connected to this crime was Jesse Miss Kelly. And Jesse Miss Kelly actually dropped out of high school. He was 17. He had a very strong record for violence and fist fights with people at school. He was known for being a very violent character. And they did go to the same school, but you didn't really know the other two. Like, they knew of each other, but they didn't really... They weren't good friends. Now, on May the 7th, the police interviewed Damien Eccles and they had a very strong intuition that Damien was involved and that he was capable of killing children and they did a polygraph test and it indicated that he was deceiving them, he was lying and apparently he had a very cocky attitude which didn't really help and in the police interview on the 9th of May he mentioned about the genital mutilation in great detail and the police thought this was very incriminating. Now the police asked Damien how he thought the person who committed the crime would have felt and Damien said he thought that the person would have felt very good and very powerful for killing three boys and the police found this a really big piece of evidence but to me it's kind of not because like I would have said the same thing you know when I didn't kill them like 
and Damien did have like an interest in true crime and that sort of thing so he would kind of know how a serial killer or a killer thing so a month passed and police still didn't really have any like solid leads or like they hadn't solved the case and they continued to interview Eccles more than anyone else and they had a really strong intuition that he was the person who did this and they were determined to prove that he did and get him sent down so on june the 3rd jesse and miss kelly he had his first police interview and his parents allowed this because obviously he is a minor so his parents had to allow it but they didn't allow that he had like a proper interrogation they just allowed that he went down to the police station and it's important to remember that jesse had an iq of 72 which is below average and the police used this against him quite badly because the police have tactics they use on people who have a lower iq where they try to kind of trick them into confessing to the crime and sadly this worked on Jesse and within two hours of his 12 hour interview he was telling them stuff which likely wasn't true and there was a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of things that definitely weren't true. What occurred while you were there? When I was there, I saw Damien hit this one, hit this one boy real bad and then he started screwing him and stuff. Alright, you've got in front of you a picture that was taken out of the newspaper, I believe. It's got three boys, and these are the three boys that were killed on that date in Robin Hood Woods. Which one of those three boys is it you say Damien hit? The third picture, which will be... This boy right here? Yeah. All right, that's uh, the buyer's boy. Christopher. That's who you're pointing at? So you saw Damien strike Chris Byers in the head. Right. What did he hit him with? He hit him with his fist and bruised him all up real bad. Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael o. Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there and then I left. Inspector Gitchell, let's talk about the things that, that Jesse told you that are just absolutely incorrect. Now, on page 9 of his statement, Inspector Gitchell, Jesse says that the murders took place around noon. How did you know that was incorrect? Because the boys were, the young boys were still in school. Did at any time when he was telling you these things that you knew were incorrect, did it ever occur to you that what he was telling you was false, his entire story was false? In Jesse's case, I feel like he did tell us a good bit of the truth, but then they also lessen their activity in a statement. That's uh, just common, at least in my 20 years career. Another way you can tell that the police definitely use these tactics is because out of his 12-hour interview, only two segments were recorded and those total to 46 minutes. He later recanted his confession and said the police scared him in the interview and made him say it which is likely true, but obviously once you've said something to the police, it's kind of hard to go back. Now, in his confession, Jesse said a lot of things. So he said that he saw Damien rape one of the boys, which, you know, this isn't true at all because none of the boys were sexually assaulted in any way. And this is confirmed by the police in the very early stages of the investigation. This definitely did not happen. And Jesse also said the murders took place at noon, but that also isn't true because the boys were obviously seen at half six that night. And they were at school then because it was a school day, so this definitely wasn't true either. And in his police questioning, obviously he was informed of his Miranda rights, which is the right to remain silent if you don't want to, you know, you can say no comment. Um, but he said he didn't really understand them, which is probably likely because of his low IQ. And the police probably didn't explain them in the best of way because they didn't want him to be silent because they knew they could get something out of it. And it was later confirmed that Jesse was definitely not involved in the murder. He had a very strong alibi. He was actually in a neighbouring town at a wrestling match. And multiple people have confirmed he was at this wrestling match. So he definitely was not involved in the murder. And this was confirmed early on in the case and investigation. Now, something else that does incriminate them, especially Jason, is a knife was actually found in a pond behind Jason's trailer park. And this could not be linked to the crime, but police took this as really strong evidence for some reason. So, on August the 4th, they all pleaded not guilty to this crime. And many people actually confessed to lying on the stand just to get them taken down for this crime. 
and sadly they all got found guilty. So Jason was sentenced to life in prison, Jesse was sentenced to life in prison plus two 20 year sentences and Damien was sentenced to death by lethal injury. Miss Kelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, Damien Eccles, I hope your master of the devil does take you soon. I want you to meet him real soon. And the day you die, I'm going to praise God. And I make you a promise. The day you die, every year on May 5th, I'm going to come to your graveside. I'm going to spit on you. I'm going to curse the day you were born. And I'm sure while I'm standing there, I'm going to have to have other bodily functions let go upon your grave. I promise you, as God is my witness, I'll visit all three of your graves. They had their satanic worship services out here, and they had all types of wild homosexual orgies, I've been told. Crazy things. To me, this place as I stand is like hell on earth because I know that three babies were killed right out here where I stand. I know my son was castrated and possibly laid there on that bank and bled to death. I know he was choked. I know one boy's head was beat in beyond recognition. I know one little boy was skinned almost like an animal. Cut, had to shave his head, had all types of injuries to the head where they just kept beating and pounding on him and killing him and killing him. It's like they enjoyed it. They killed him two or three times. Now it was after the sentencing that this case actually got a lot of attention nationwide and a lot of celebrities actually started like petitioning and stuff to get these boys freed because there was absolutely no evidence linking them to the crime scene, it was just kind of the town's bias against them. And with these sorts of tragic cases, most of the time they just, people in the police just want to get someone to be serving time for this crime even if it's not the right person and that's what's happened in this case and a lot of people were very angry and a lot of people actually thought they didn't do it but these people only came out after they'd been sentenced so there wasn't really so much that they could do. To get, you know, kind of familiarise myself with the case, I knew instantly that they were innocent. I knew instantly that they were wrongfully accused. And um, the more research I did and the more people I spoke to, um, it was absolutely apparent. Like, the only reason that they'd actually been arrested was because it was thought to be satanic. But it was later found out that this creek actually had these special turtles in. And these turtles were known for biting. And it's thought that a lot of the marks on the boys were actually from these turtles biting at them. So there was actually no evidence whatsoever against them. I really don't understand how they got put down for this crime when there was literally no evidence. And it doesn't help there were so many mistakes with this crime, like it took two hours for the police to call the coroner and the police removed the bodies from the water which is total contamination of the crime scene and as well they left them like on the side of the creek. Now obviously this case did receive a lot of attention and it was in 1996 that Paradise 3 the movie based off of this case came out and the boys tried and tried again to get out of jail. They set up so many hearings and they were refused so many times. Now in 2007 they actually found DNA evidence proving that the boys did not commit this crime yet they still didn't let them out of jail. But now finally in 2010 they were allowed another trial and at this trial they were offered a deal. So they were offered the Alfred plea which basically this is where you plead guilty to a crime to lesser your sentence but at the same time you maintain your innocence which doesn't really make a lot of sense but they were all offered this and they accepted and they were all given 10 year sentences for the crime but obviously they've been in jail at this point for 18 years each they didn't do this crime and this was proved now they still served 18 years and this baffles me like Damien his girlfriend was pregnant and she waited for him but he had a child who was like 17, 18, who hadn't grown up with him. You know, these boys were so young and they spent half of their lives in jail. It really upsets me. So now the people of the town are at a bit of a loss because they wanted someone to go down for this crime. They were back to where they were multiple years ago when the crime first happened. And they wanted someone to pay for this crime and it's still unsolved to this day. There's been so many other suspects who I'll get into in a sec but I just, 
it is a heartbreaking case but i just really disagree with how they treated these three boys so one of the other suspects is john byers christopher byers adopted father and there's not really much evidence for this one but basically during the first trial he actually got all of his teeth removed and replaced because obviously there were bite marks on the bodies and if you have a new set of teeth then your teeth can't be like matched to them and he just said this was for health issues and i don't I mean it is a little bit like suspicious the timing but I don't really like see a massive problem with this because like I know lots of people who have had like their teeth removed and new ones put in so it's not like a big big deal I don't think. Now another reason that John is suspected sometimes is because um, basically they were doing like lots of documentaries on this case and I don't really understand this like none of the articles explained it well but like he handed a knife to a cameraman on this documentary and the knife belonged to him and it had blood on it and the blood was like dried and quite old but he said it had never been used before and he did a polygraph test for this documentary and the results couldn't come through because it determined that he was actually on drugs which were like just to help with his nerves I guess but I really don't think that John did it he just I don't know I think that the next two suspects are a lot more likely to have done it now the next suspect is Terry Hobbs who is the stepfather of Stevie Branch if you remember one of the boys and he was actually very abusive towards like all of his family. And Stevie had a sister called Amanda and Amanda she was a few years younger she was four and a half at the time of the murder and it was thought that she was being sexually assaulted by Terry and in interviews she's said now she's addicted to drugs and that she's gone to drugs to help her forget her childhood and now she can't really remember much of it. It was exhibit one, pages from Amanda Hobbs's journal in her handwriting. You know, I think I'm the only 19 year old that can't remember what happened in my life 10 years ago. Was I traumatized as a child that I had to turn to drugs to forget about it? I used to tell my mom my dad messed with me. But he used to buckle. And it left a welt probably that thick across the whole back, and it was purple. I know Stevie asked me about two weeks before was murdered to leave Terry, and I asked him why, and he said he loves Amanda, but he don't love me. I feel like I'm uh, putting the pieces of a puzzle together, and I'm so scared. And on the day of the murder, um, Terry had actually hit Stevie, which he did quite a lot, and he had like left a mark with his belt, and. Obviously police saw this on the body and he had to tell police that he'd done this and he actually did this quite a lot like Terry was scared of his stepfather, he was very scared of him. And he was also the last person to be seen with them, if you remember he was the last person to see them at 6.30, see all the boys. And there's a woman who lives in the area called Mildred French and he actually broke into her house and at the time she was in the bath and he walked into her bathroom and obviously she was screaming like what are you doing, get out. Then he started trying to shush her and he was like grabbing her breasts and then he just ran and left. So this guy was known for being a bit of a weirdo. He actually assaulted so many people. He just assaulted his own brother. And he's literally been seen to hold Stevie by his hair off ground. And John Boyers actually said that Terry is a baby killer. So even the other parents think that he did this. And like I said, a lot of celebrities got involved with this. And a celebrity called Natalie Maines, she was a singer. And before the West Memphis Free were released from prison, he was basically saying that she thought they didn't do it and they should look more into Terry. And Terry tried to sue her for like ruining his name and obviously he didn't win, but he was a very dodgy guy and I think that they should have looked into him more. The DNA evidence they found in 2007 was actually linked to him. It was one of his hairs tied into one of the shoelaces. I really don't understand how the police have done nothing with this, like they've literally got evidence that he was there. Now the final suspect, I think he could have done it as well. With me it's like him and Terry are kind of tied with who I think did it. But we don't know this guy's name, he's nicknamed Mr Bajangles, which I was like, what the hell is a Bajangles? But it's basically like a restaurant in America and the town had their own Bajangles restaurant. And on the night of the murder, a black male walked into the Bajangles restaurant it was about quarter to nine so after the murders had taken place and he went into the girls bathroom and he was covered in blood and obviously you can't go into the girls bathroom and he was like wiping the blood everywhere so an employee called the police and the police came and took samples of the blood but it wasn't until a few days later he was actually connected to the crime when the manager kind of connected the dots and he kind of went back to the police so i mentioned it to see if it was possible 
So the police went back to see if there's any more evidence and this guy had left, well it's thought that this guy left his sunglasses there. So they took the sunglasses in but shocker shocker, they lost the DNA evidence that they had from the blood. Uh, so we don't know if it matched anyone in the database at all because they lost it, which seems to happen a lot in these cases. Just yeah. And a black hair was found as well and this was confirmed to belong to Mr Bajangles but we still don't have any idea who he is and I think he could have done it because it was found at the crime scene this black hair was so it just seems very suspicious like the timing of him coming into the restaurant covered in blood but yeah this is the end of this case but Damien he's now living his best life he moved away from the town I'm not really sure what the other two are doing but obviously they're living their best lives as well I guess Damien actually writes his own music and everything He's a very like kind of poetic guy, but I think it's so sad this case because three boys got murdered and I just want to say the first time I ever heard of this case I presume that the West Memphis Three would refer to the three boys who got killed like Stevie, Christopher and James. It doesn't, it refers to Damien, Jesse and Jason which I feel like in this case the three boys who actually got killed are left out quite a lot. You know they're kind of left behind and the focus is on like who killed them and it's so sad like these three boys were eight years old they did not deserve this and they had big plans for their lives you know all little boys do obviously it's so sad what happened to the West Memphis Free as well like the amount of time they spent in jail and they got like so much hate for kind of what they believed in and how they looked in their type and stereotyping this case honestly just it's one of those it just upsets me because I want it to be solved but I don't think it will get solved which is very sad because these boys deserve justice and the West Memphis Free as well deserve justice to find out who watched them go to jail for this long so like I said you know I think it's so sad and these boys get left behind so I just want to put a little section in to remember them I guess because I think they don't get remembered enough. So Stevie Edward Branch was born November 26, 1984. Obviously he's eight years old at the time of his murder. James Michael Moore, who was born July 17th, 1984. Again, eight years old at the time of his murder. Christopher Mark Byers, born June 23rd, 1984. I hope you've enjoyed this video and you've learned something. And please remember if you've researched this case, beware of the pictures you will find online. But yeah, I will see you all on the next one. Bye guys.